How's the loop sculpture? Yeah, so the founder and the sandblaster, it's still a lot of work. Yeah. But I'm yeah. close to the end. So you still have the studio in, in Sukkreutz? Yeah, I've got a studio near, do you know the Malzfabrik? Huh? You've been to the studio? Yes, I've yeah, been, yeah. yeah. Yeah, same studio, I mean, uh, long term we need a bit more space, we're starting to run out of space. Yeah, yeah. But it's fine. But it's a big one, I mean. The two people, 60 square meters. It's 60? okay, but we both collect a lot of materials. So. But you have also the other part, like the workshop, metal workshop, yeah, that you can use. We can use, mm. but it's not our space. Mm. So, yeah, if, when we're doing metal projects, mm. it's very useful, but okay. we also need a lot of storage. And sure. we're both sculptors, so we collect a lot of materials and yeah, yeah, storage is expensive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this apartment was yeah. bigger. <laughs> yeah. Now we are collecting um, sofa, and then we have yeah. sculpture, the exhibition going on. So it's I feel like getting smaller and smaller. Like, do you have a basement? No, I don't have any keller. Oh fuck! It's fuck no. Oh, but I'm not I, allowed to swear. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, I'm, I think I will. I will. Uh, will follow your advice. Like dig a hole on the forest and put my sculpture there. Depends what sculpture, but yeah, wrap it this, in plastic. This, yeah, very good, like yeah. isolating them. Or throw it in the canal or something. No, come on, a canal. Why not? I, I, don't hey, I saw two people yesterday walking on the canal. Because of the ice. Yeah, it's all frozen. I mean, pretty risky, but mm. I've got some photos I'll show you later. I saw a guy falling down before it was uh, like um, really? frozen. It was half frozen. Okay. Yeah, it was, was I, don't, I don't know, I was drunk maybe. It's not so nice experience. 2021. <laughs> <laughs> you should do like a sculpture in uh, ice, in snow, a, a snowman. A snowman? Yeah. Well then, yeah, every, every child's a sculptor then. Yeah. <laughs> So, welcome to another episode of Meyer Pavilion Podcast, a space for art and the discussion, a space for reconnect people and community, a space to share ideas and upgrade our vision about the world and about ourselves. Now more than before, we feel the need of um, upgrade our vision of the, of the world. Today we're going to cover a very important topic which is human relation with nature. Uh, from the early cave painting to the six mass extinction. So, and today host is uh, Richard Green. Welcome, Richard. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Richard is a young artist, uh, a mixed media sculptor born in Cambridge, UK, and currently living and working in Berlin. He is working freelancer in two bronze foundries, are you still working in the foundries? So? Every now and then, freelancing. Okay. Yeah. Making molds, casting, sculpture, uh, pouring molten metal is the best uh, place for winter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is how, by the way, we got to know each other. In this project, Richard addresses and questions current human issues regarding nature, technology, and how to address climate change. Um, he moved to Berlin after studying fine art in England. Since living in Berlin, he has set up his uh, sculpture studio in uh, Südkreuz and currently is working on a series of sculpture in bronze. Um, in his sculpture, um, earthquake stabilization uh, system, which are the one, the, the three that are behind you, you uh, prepare this uh, cactus uh, to the possibility of an earthquake. Yeah. I'm very curious about this uh, earthquake system because it's a kind of part, kind of a paradox, no? How humans take care of nature by the same act of caring about nature, actually it doesn't. And like, it does the opposite, no? Creating structure over structure. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just stop raising the Amazon, no? <laughs> so my question is, why would you prepare a plant for a natural, a natural disaster? 
I don't know, I think it's kind of like an absurdity mm. um, which points towards... I don't know, I guess it was kind of like a comical take on mm. humans' interaction with nature. Mm. So over-protection or over-preparation for something which... I mean, we're in Berlin here. Yeah. We haven't had many earthquakes in the last few years. No. <laughs> um, but I guess it's just talking about nature, humans' interaction with it. Um, and, I mean, a cactus on its own yeah. is fine in nature. It's, if it's got the right living conditions, it's sure. going to thrive. But humans have, I don't know, they've decided to collect plants, put mm. them in pots mm. or put them in greenhouses, mm. uh, genetically modify or prepare plants mm. for, I don't know, mass produce the vegetables mm. or, I, I don't know, I'm just trying to yeah. loosely yeah. question these, our relationship with the natural world. Yeah, yeah. But this plant comes from uh, Peru, so now it's uh, it's kind of a strange environment, no? Uh, yeah, of course. I actually uh, <laughs> we had them at the foundry, mm. and another artist uh, imported these uh, San Pedro cactus uh, okay. to cast them in bronze, and so we built a mold out of silicon plaster. And when mm. we had the mold, the mm. actual uh, cacti, the living cacti, were kind of disregarded. So this living thing which had travelled with post to the foundry and then okay. by my bosses just been thought of as being thrown away into a skip somewhere in Berlin yeah, and I yeah, thought yeah. okay I'm going to try and just plant them see what happens so I took them home mm -hmm. in like some cardboard tubes and planted them and then I thought okay how can this develop uh, I got well actually a lot of the materials I used for these uh, mm -hmm. stabilization systems are also I think 95% of it is recycled. Recycled, yeah. So it's also this nice idea of uh, turning these recycled materials mm. um, into, I don't know if it's half art, half designer object, mm. but I think uh, there is a design aspect to it mm -mm -mm. because it serves a purpose sure. to help the cactus grow in the pot. Sure. So when it doesn't have a root system, mm -mm -mm it's going to fall over and it's very difficult for the cactus to grow. But so usually someone will just put, I don't know, a bit of bamboo or a stick with a bit of string to support one of these uh, column cactus mm -hmm. so it doesn't fall over. But I thought, okay, how can I use the materials that are recycled to make something that's more interesting and pushing these limits? Okay, okay. Um, and also, it's quite funny, like the acrostyle and mm. some of the bits of, well, more the plastic, but mm -hmm. you see in this one here, um, a lot of this acrylic and the plastic pieces, mm -hmm. uh, I was helping for one or two days take down an exhibition talking about mm. microplastics and plastic in the ocean. Ah, okay, and so then that was at perfect. The, <laughs> at, at the end of the exhibition, mm. they took down the whole display case and threw all this plastic, ironically, into the rubbish. <laughs> this is the and, paradox. <laughs> and the funny thing is, a lot of this is worth a lot of money, you know? Some mm. of these tubes are so big, you mm. have to cast the plastic instead mm. of, I think, extrude it or something like that. Mm. So it's a lot of energy, labor-intensive materials that are just being thrown away. Mm. And the irony of having an exhibition talking about waste in the ocean and then that exhibition ending up in the waste, I kind of thought that's quite interesting. Mm. Alongside this cactus, um, I don't know, this idea of recycling, living a bit mm. more um, sustainably. In harmony. Yeah, mm. I mean, it's quite, they're not perfect materials. There's scratches and there's wear and tear, but that, mm. I guess, adds to it. Yeah, mm. who cares? I mean, uh, most of the friends uh, came to visit and also people, random people that uh, apply to, to visit this um, project space were asking me, uh, are this artwork um, made by an engineer? Uh, because a earthquake system, you know, I was speaking about earthquake system. <laughs> uh, and I said, 
Um, Richard, Richard is a sculptor for sure. I don't know if he's a, also an engineer. Uh, did you uh, like? A, I don't know. I think no? I probably played okay, okay. a lot too much, uh, too much Lego as a child. Ah, okay. I mean, this is never going to survive an earthquake, mm. and that's part of the absurdity. Who knows? I mean, we have to test them. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, in, in the near I'm future. Just, no, I'm pretty certain this is not going to survive an earthquake. <laughs> but if survive, but the, the idea the of humans yeah. mm. trying to prepare mm. a plant or something in nature or control the nature mm. and protect it from another natural disaster, uh, disaster uh, a natural phenomenon, mm -mm. Uh, but then also creating something that's useless in that event is kind of part of this joke and this absurdity oh, okay. or this revealing of how useless our help sometimes can be. Yeah. You know, exactly. or how actually the power of these natural phenomena are just going to wipe out a yeah. lot of the things that we try and... Absolutely. These survival... Elements, yeah, know. it makes me think uh, like the way in which you question also the the carer of the nature, yeah. um, um, <laughs> remarking the absurdity of the human action no? somehow, yeah. um, even when uh, is about to take care about the nature. Instead of creating a technological system to protect nature, it will be easier to to stop just erasing the forest <laughs> just to begin with i mean yeah we've got a lot it's, we're living in a difficult time mm. i think we have to we don't have that much time to change things around mm. before we w really come to a tipping point and that's yeah. i think we've probably got about 10 years or so until we reach this tipping point that's what scientists are predicting mm. and uh so we have to address the problem from different angles so yeah. it's like if you're filling a bathtub with water mm -hmm. and it's overflowing, what do you do? Do you take a bucket and start emptying the bathtub or yeah. do you turn off the tap? Okay. So stop the problem at the source. And mm -hmm. so I guess in order to get in the bathtub mm -hmm. when it's completely full, even if you've turned off the tap, you also have to take a bucket and empty some of the water. So you have yeah. to also address problems at the source. So this deforestation, why is it happening? What kind of alternatives are there? But mm. then also invest in other technologies such mm. as, I mean, there's lots of companies looking into uh, different kind of algaes, mm. that kind of, or CO2 extraction systems so that we're kind of trying to slow down our CO2 release into the atmosphere. Yeah. There's a lot of different like technologies out there. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. We couldn't stop uh, like from But I think it's a combination of both. Mm. And we have to in order to Absolutely. in our time frame keep everything under control and Yeah, 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 yeah. If yeah. the lockdown will not stop our uh, I mean, businesses. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the lockdown the slowed down <laughs> yeah. 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 Slowed down a lot of Yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, polluting, but I like I like the idea of uh, like um, th this two side to take in consideration. Oh. You Listen. know, deforestation is kind of happening because of our we want to consume, and then we have to look at what are we consuming? Why are these rainforests being cut down? And mm. a huge percentage is cut down to grow crops mm. for live feed uh, yeah. for cattle mm. and things like this. So I think that humanity has to start questioning mm. what our consumption, what the effects are, and what you as an individual can do to combat this. Yeah. Um, and I mean, a lot of people are always complaining about palm oil, this kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, a lot more deforestation and damage to the environment happens through our consumption of meat and mm. growing crops to feed this vast amount of cattle. Sure, sure. Um, it's, and the rainforest is not going to keep up with the way we're destroying it, you know. Mm -mm -mm. And all this, uh, the center is uh, our uh, conception, our understanding of the world nature. Nature is a, is a man-made world and somehow create this distance between nature and human. Yeah. And when, when does it, it start this? I mean, yeah, I think you've summarized well that it's kind of like 
It's, it's a man-made word. Hmm. Like everything. I don't know when it exactly developed. Mm. I, th I think words and how they develop, it takes a long time mm. and language is quite yeah. complex. Um, but I think it's also it, this, because we're, we see ourselves different from nature, it's also in the way of us really tackling the problem. Mm. Um, I don't know if you can change people's perception that quickly to see ourselves as part of nature, but if we see ourselves as damaging not just the planet and nature, but also damaging ourselves, then I mm. think people are going to see why it's so important, because yeah. there's the problem, you know, you... A, a lot of these things that we do now only have an effect in 10 years. There's no direct... Uh, mm -hmm response or there's no direct feedback yeah. and so people just carry on consuming doing things out of habit but mm. we're only going to really see the damaging effects years down the line mm -mm -mm. so i mean this word this is word play but how how do you as a society kind of change people's perception um so that people see themselves as part of this very complex system where we happen to be in one of the, the most powerful mm. or in the most powerful spot in nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to really become more carers than see ourselves as something different from nature. Ab yeah. Absolutely. The idea of nature is, uh, is the very core of science and uh, even when the uh, the concern, the social and political concern about present uh, preservation of nature is becoming like a major topic nowadays. We still have this problem of um, the, the 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 concept of nature it is still like ungraspable somehow. And uh, if we take a look the the origin of the word nature um, has changed across the human history so many times. Um, so many times change meaning, etymology and semiotic and um, we have seen at the beginning of uh, the 60s that the most like famous movement uh, which was the ecological movement taking place uh, to to preserve, uh, to, to avoid pollution and preserve uh, wildness. Hmm. And then in the 80s we have this uh, theory of uh, biological preservation theory which uh, was concerning about uh, the loss of uh, biological um, bi um, biological systems, and then we have. Um, but if you if we go even back, like the origin of the word nature come from Greek origin, which is yeah. uh, phyphis, which is, means uh, growing and producing, and and uh, this growing and producing uh, take. Um, a very meaning, meaningful concept in the Aristotle uh, point of view, uh, which was the, the founder of the, the all like academic uh, discipline, like, yeah. uh, scientific uh, discipline. And Aristotle was mentioned nature as uh, the matter of the nature of the tree is what uh, an object or an element is uh, is uh, made of. Yeah. The, the nature of the tree, the nature of the uh, the mountain, the nature of the, the sea. And then we have, with the Christianization of the uh, Roman Empire, we have this, um, uh, this idea of nature as a creation, mm -hmm. the creation of God. Uh, so in, um, in this creation of God, we, um, we have the monotheistic point of view. Um, um, the God, in, somehow the God transcend nature, therefore also transcend of also human. While Greek point of view, um, the God was part of the nature because it was a pol polytheistic point of view. Nature was uh, God and God was part of nature. Yeah. We have the, the power of uh, the water, the fire, all part of gods. Um, in the, um, so, so this, this polytheistic point of view transformed um, gradually into monotheistic with the Christianization of the Roman Empire. And in Plato we see the dualism point of view which uh, uh, make a distinction between uh, physical world, material world and spiritual world.
Yeah. And, uh, and, and God is not found anymore in nature. Uh, God is um, it's something that transcends mm. nature. And we can see also this uh, nature was, um, was no more viewed as a sacred, but as, a, as a something that ha is a raw product. material. Yeah, is a raw, pro uh, uh, is a raw product that human has to use and, uh, and, uh, he, and produce. Well, God something. gave humans the power to exactly. yeah. look after and also yeah. exploit nature. Yeah, and the Genesis we have, I wrote it down, uh, the Genesis says, make the earth full and be master of it, be rules over every living thing moving on the earth, they will be for you food. And yeah. this is a, a part of Genesis 1.28. Yeah. So Christian ruined the world, <laughs> kind of. What's, what uh, is the, but I, I want to more... religion. Yeah, religion in general. What is the, the meaning of, of this uh, word, uh, nature in your work? Well, I guess uh, the materials in the sculpture, mm -hmm. so I'm combining uh, these plastics, these man-made objects, these extractions from raw materials. So mm. this plexiglass has been made with, started off as probably oil in some ocean. Yeah. Uh, lots, a few bits of metal, they've all had to have machines to work them, these mm. screws and bolts. Uh, even the glue that I used to uh, fuse some of the bits of plexiglass together. Mm. There's some kind of man-made origin. And then you have this contrast yeah. um, with this non-man-made object, so this plant. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's a contrast between the materials and that questions what's natural. When I see your work, there is not this distinction between nature and human. I mean, um, you represent this uh, human taking care of uh, nature, but like in a humoristic uh, I mean, aspect, I, like paradoxical yeah. aspect, but it is, it's kind of a background for you. It's like uh, um, make, uh, laughing about how human can take care of nature when I mean, actually humans not. are capable of looking after mm. nature, there's mm. no doubt. Sure. It's just some elements of how... But is it just an idea sometimes, no? Is it just a theory? Or or I mean, every system has a certain element of corruption mm. and people who are then going to use that system to earn money or very, I don't know, there's a lot of egos out there sure. and a lot of good intentions that sometimes never end up being what they could be. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's the focus. I, I'm not really trying to question what what our definition of nature is. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear, even as a word, that humans are part of nature. Mm, 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 mm. Um, when you talk about it with people, it's, it's not really a secret, yeah. but then our actions don't reflect mm. this understanding of what exactly. is nature. Yeah. You know, if you talk to, I can't think of a good example, but, I think it's just, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to expose that although most, most people have an understanding of nature and that we are part of this intricate system, mm. our actual actions aren't really reflected in that understanding, you know, or maybe the, the actions are twisted, you know, what started off as a good intention is then in the end the result is not that productive in a way yeah yeah when i think about relation between human and nature i think uh, this film uh, called uh, koyanis katsi okay uh, did you see did you I've ever seen it i've, okay. I've heard of it it's a, it's a experimental movie it's not really a documentary it's there's no conversation it's uh, nothing that uh, connect to to a documentary about nature and um, exactly because of this reason is a very good documentary. <laughs> it was uh, made in the 1982. Uh, director is Godfrey Reggio, with the soundtrack of uh, Philip Glass. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And 
but the most important um, the most important uh, like concept that I took from this film is that humanity is kind of a, like a background in this in this film there is a uh, a city and there is a uh, a building uh, destroying like a, a destruction of a building but it's always like a background it's not the, like the main scene of mm. this this film so everything is like in movement we have this like time lapse of cities that are, look like a uh, like transforming constantly, moving like frenetically, yeah. and then we have this uh, uh, um, waterfall uh, and the, the forest, uh, the same situation but different, no, or organization, and it's um, and it's interesting because most of the 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 most important event uh, that we are living is uh, is unseen yeah. uh, in the. Um, it's 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 gone unnoticed. Um, it's it's not shown on the on the on the paper on the newspaper, and uh, it's not shown on the on the TV and the news. Um, and the most important even for me is the transition from nature as a host of uh, humanity to technology, mass technology as a host of humanity. So everything that happened in our um, life, like culture, politics, uh, religion, mm. um, activity, are inside in this ecosystem, which uh, uh, this uh, ecosystem, which is technology, It's never been. Um, the, it is not nature. So we are thinking still in this um, system, which is technology. It's uh, everything that we think, and then we process it's it's inside in this mass technology and since technology as as like uh, ubiquitous as a uh, the air that we breathe we mm. we naturally don't question it and something that a life that is no question uh, it's a life uh, like lived in a religious way yeah and how, how do you think we can question more the way in which we live it's it's art okay. Can be a. <laughs> I mean, art is part of part of the yeah. problem. Art is uh, part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> art is a problem. The exhibition, the exhibition that we saw. <laughs> Don't trust. About. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, we're yeah. living in an interesting time with this lockdown yeah. and everything. Mm. Uh, people are questioning their values, yeah. how they live their life, what they really need. Mm. Uh, a lot of people have lost their close ones, um, and so you start to re-value um, what's important in life. And uh, okay, you're doing home office for a few months, but mm. these social connections are actually what's keeping you sane. Mm. Or a Zoom call can never replace um, physical meetings. Sure. Or I don't know. It's a very interesting time and. Mm. So art is part of how you question. It's just one way for in order to express our need to um, to get in touch with our our needs again. I mean, Absolutely. politics is also very important. I think we have the internet. You just have to do a bit of research, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and I don't know. You just have to. I don't know, I don't want to tell anyone how to live their life, but I think people should just generally, society should be better at reflecting, self, self reflection, mm. um, more, con more communication has to happen mm. in regards to people's needs and uh, finding solutions on yeah. a bigger scale. But at the end of the day, a lot of change always happens, a lot of um, revolution happens with one person with an idea and it grows from the roots up yeah yeah and this is why I think as a society um, the whole food industry and the whole way that we produce food has to be completely rethought the way that we uh, build cities or cater for homelessness or whatever has to be rethought mm. Uh, there's a whole, the whole infrastructure has to be questioned. I don't, you can't change everything at once, but these gradual changes are going to have to happen at some point. 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. it's very complex. I could yeah, yeah. We don't have all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this change taking place. Uh, I mean, right now, um, if I think, for example, the the first human who paint bisons on the hidden caves. Uh, Uh, nature was uh, not only like a subject to portray, yep. but it was a, is a, a vital force, uh, like a power, natural power, uh, to to kind of uh, master in their mind and to be guided by. And how much it changed this point of this uh, this um, relation between human and nature since then. How long is your interview? <laughs> <laughs> as much uh, as uh, they can record this uh, tools, this technological oh tools. Um, yeah, I need to think about that one. <laughs> I mean, I think... It changed a lot. Well, we've just... We haven't... It's pretty obvious that we don't have the same connection to nature as the people who lived in hidden caves. Yeah. Uh, they had a connection with nature which was about survival. Mm. So they had a direct... They lived in nature. I mean, we're all part of nature now, yeah. but buildings or architecture in that grander scheme of things is unnatural. Yeah. But if you're living in a cave and you've got dangerous animals outside or weather conditions just around every corner, and you're fighting to survive, then your relationship and your respect to nature is completely different. Where mm. we have now lived, we have comfort, um, we have everything at the click of, the click of a button. Yeah. Um, if we want to experience nature, then we go for a walk yeah. uh, the through garden. the woods <laughs> with, with a dog, you know. Um, yeah. But is, that's not really the same level of nature, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, I can't sum up for like the whole human evolution in yeah, regards to yeah. nature, but yeah, our, we just have a complete different understanding or lack of understanding of what nature is. And sure. this has, has to change because, I mean, I'm going to go back to like the food system, how, how important it is as a society to look at what's damaging and what we consume and how to change the food system. Mm -mm -mm. Um, when you go to a supermarket, you see everything packed in plastic. You don't see an animal or a product that is behind sure. it. Um, Whereas in the past, you'd have to hunt the animal, you'd have to sure. uh, chase it or track it down, or uh, you'd know what area to go to to collect certain plants, mm -hmm. or there's a complete different understanding and a value. And um, yes, yeah, I guess that's why they were painting almost in like a... Uh, I don't know, they were painting these things that were important to them mm -hmm. of their time on cave walls. Yeah. And it's a form of storytelling. Yeah. yeah. So we're just, we're doing the same thing now, but with other things, you know. Yeah. We don't have to hunt our food, so that's not the main focus of yeah. our storytelling. And we don't have to do art our to survive. We don't. Yeah. But at the time, yes. <laughs> well, the, the, did we have to do art then to survive? Uh, I mean, the, the theory Some of... Some elements mm. of it, maybe, um, if you're trying to... Com I mean, art is communication. Mm. So on these cave paintings, what are they trying to communicate? Are they trying to tell people where there's a bit of water, where the bison meet, or where there's some plants that are edible? or which plants not to eat. I mean, this communication has just changed and we don't have to nowadays communicate that there's a lid around the corner. Or, I mean, obviously there's good websites recommending a few products, but uh -huh. it's not, you don't need to um, know where your, near to, your nearest shop is. Yeah, and this is also the, the reason why Homo sapiens survived. 
instead of uh, Neanderthal because he had this capacity of uh, process images quite well, much much better than uh, almost uh, much better than uh, Neanderthal because he had to move from uh, like uh, hint, uh, hunting animal from face to face like body body to like long distances. So he had to uh, he developed this uh, parietal cortex which would provide the uh, processing better the images and also provide imagination. I mean, there's, yeah, it's, a, it's still pretty new kind of like, I mean, yeah. the whole scientific community is also discussing why uh, Homo sapiens brains developed how they did. Because of the hunting process? Not, not completely. Mm. I mean, at the same time as we started hunting animals, uh, from what I understood, is we also learn how to uh, like cook and process um, mm. like potatoes or calories, uh, mm. uh, like carbohydrates and stuff. So, and also the focus on how much we actually hunted and lived off just animals in the past is actually mm. quite far from reality. So mm. there's a lot of archaeologists who are finding like remains and bones and like cutting slices out of the bone under a microscope you can kind okay. of or through some kind of special imaging you can um, see exactly what kind of diet or what kind of nutrients they're taking in and a lot this is the problem um, I don't know, somehow there's this illusion that we only lived off meat and things, but a lot, actually, we were more into foraging mm -hmm. and actually hunting animals. It wasn't as much of a, of a focus. And this mm. is also part of the problem. If you find a grave of, a, of early humans mm. or whatever, plant matter, it kind of rots away. It's very difficult to find any remains of plants yeah. or um, or the importance of the plants whereas if someone was buried with animals for the afterlife mm -hmm. or whatever then their bones are going to remain in uh, in yeah, the fossil. funeral space you fossil. know there's it's kind of it's still being debated like what kind of focus mm -hmm. um, yeah, they yeah. had I mean have you read the book Sapiens? No you should look into it. It's very interesting it's okay. how humans developed, how they, uh, humans, Homo sapiens kind of uh, killed off Neanderthal. Um, mm. There used to be huge, vast amounts of animal species, huge, um, like, like, not dodos are like a bad example, but yeah. like huge, this is after the dinosaur period, but. They're just vast amounts of animals that we've just killed off as humans. Um, it's crazy. Like this destruction hasn't just started recently. You know, humans Absolutely. have been exploiting for a very long time. It's kind of in our DNA. So it's not an, a very easy problem to solve. Yeah, and this is what you're speaking about is the beginning of the sixth mass, mass extinction. Yeah. The scientists uh, uh, trace back the, the beginning of the uh, the sixth mass as extinction to that time, to the um, the act of killing of uh, bisons, okay. like in in very large quantity, and so they they think that <laughs> sixth mass extinction is actually quite quite uh, already like ongoing. It's not something new. Yeah, mm. I crazy. Mean, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there is any project you are working in at the moment? Uh, I've got a few other projects. Yeah. Um, this is, yeah, I've got an exhibition in October. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to, I've proposed uh, to build an orchestra of uh, kinetic sculptures. Oh. And now I've got the project. And the problem is funding and time management and <laughs> the reality of building 30 kinetic sculptures in a period of time. Mm. Um, but anyway, the idea is to, to build lots of clapping machines. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, huge lumps of rubber or also smaller bits of rubber which abstractly uh, metaphor for hands or flesh or yeah. something organic and human yeah. being controlled by um, motors and artificial materials so also like this once again there's a certain contrast between man-made and yeah. Uh, machine mm -hmm. um, and I want to try and get these machines to like an audience clap but then you can mm -hmm. change and synchronize or unsynchronize and change mm -hmm. the kind of clapping mm -hmm. or the feeling that you get through this clapping so you can maybe you can achieve a very happy atmosphere or very sarcastic kind of clapping, or if everything's going chaotic and these huge machines are like clapping away and lots of small ones, and uh -huh. then there's a certain form of aggression or like chaos, which could be very interesting. And this, um, if I have the time, I'd like to get a few composers to, um, to help me create different kinds of compositions for these machines but I've bitten off a lot so I'm gonna see how yeah. how realistic um, it is to do lots of different compositions you know yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm positive I just need to start with testing different kinds of rubber different shapes mm. uh, um, yeah, and then the other big project I'm working on, uh, I think I mentioned it last time, was I'm working on sh some sugar sculptures. Hmm. Um, and I want to have a series of three or four large scale sugar sculptures, like two or three meters big, filmed in the forest environment, like huge monolithic abstract shapes which hmm. contrast once again to the nature. So very ge geometric straight lines with the sunlight coming through the sugar like a stained glass window. And the idea is to film it melting away within nature. Um, so the weather conditions, mm. ants, animals. different animals. Mm. Children. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many children will be running around the forest for, but <laughs> with over a few weeks or maybe even a mm. month, there's going to be this gradual change from very geometric, mm. perfect shapes, which I have cast in sugar, mm. then melting, falling apart, crumbling mm. into just a pile of sugar or not even a pile it's just gonna end up being the nature again you know yeah. so this is an idea of, I'm playing around with I'm working on some models at the moment working with some CNC machines and 3d mm. printers to get the shape just right okay um, but like I said I need to focus my energies on these, the orchestra, orchestra and which this is the other first. one, this other big project, they're two large scale projects. Mm. Um, I haven't put it on ice, but it's uh, just more in the background at the moment. Okay. okay. So I'm working on the models, but my focus is more on this orchestra of mm -mm -mm. So clapping this, machines. This year we, we're going to see the... Uh, it's going to be a crazy year, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Straight up lockdown into... Yeah. Full production mode. If you need help, man, uh, I am always uh, yeah. available if I don't do any <laughs> recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice to give to the new generation of artists, like we are the old generation? <laughs> I mean, at the beginning, you described me as a young artist. Yeah, it's 28, no? 27, yeah. 28. But now I'm an old generation of artists. We are all old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, no, I don't have any advice. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm okay, advice for the young generation of artists. I mean, I'm still... Who works in this uh, topic of uh, relation with... Uh, I mean, I am one of these. It's difficult to give my generation advice. I mm. consider myself one of these younger generation artists mm. who have started waking up to these topics, you know? Mm hmm um, a few, uh, well, a lot of artists are addressing these problems at the moment. Mm. Um, advice would be 
make lots of work. I mean, make work about things that you know about and that interest you. And I'm guessing more and more artists are going to be interested in these important issues about nature mm. and humans' interaction because it's the question of our time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, try and uh, my advice would be. I mean, the world's full of contradictions, but try and question your own impact on the environment, mm -hmm. not just through your art, but in how you live your life. Yeah, every single action that we do daily. Yeah, I mean, mm. you, you've got to start somewhere. You probably, mm. You're going to be overwhelmed if you question every single action and where mm. everything comes from. But, mm -hmm. I mean, small things. Don't always go to Ikea to buy furniture mm. or go to a shop to buy clothes, look at mm. second-hand options mm -hmm. or recycling mm -hmm. or yeah. Um, yeah, questioning something you do three times a day, mm -hmm. so your diet mm -hmm. and what you eat, your consumption. Yeah. I mean, you're Italian, so we, we I'm all, not going to bang on about like consuming too much meat or dairy products, but these are small things that you can do which actually have a bigger impact and you're leading by example not just through your artwork mm -hmm. but as an artist and I think once you align your artwork and your art practice then there's just a lot more harmony and clearness in your mind of what absolutely what you're trying to achieve yeah 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 you can express a lot of nice beautiful things throughout art but then the way in which you live uh, can be totally not in harmony. I mean, some people can hey. live with that contradiction or are very mm. happy to not ever question that contradiction. But I, would, I wouldn't be happy kind of doing that. Mm. I think I would, it would be stuck in my mind. And mm. I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm still mm. probably got quite a few contradictions that I should try and address. But... Sure. Um, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, is this lockdown help? Uh, did help you to uh, to I don't know reconnect more with uh, with uh, yourself? Um, did did they have any any beneficial this lockdown in your art practice? No, no. <laughs> no I mean, I got <laughs> bad side. I got a lot of money from the government. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, this is, um, you should cut it. Okay. No, cut. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm pulling your leg. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, the lockdown hasn't really stopped me going to the studio. You know, I haven't mm. had to do home office. I had a few projects lined up, which mm. I've been working through. So my life hasn't been that different apart from social life or certain wearing a mask or distancing, but actual art production hasn't changed that much. Mm. Um, I mean, I was interested in... Um, my interest for some of these themes which are now because of the lockdown more present hasn't really changed you know I was questioning these things anyway how we're living our lives or what do we really need before mm. uh, the lockdown happened mm -hmm. yeah so I don't I don't think it's dramatically changed my view of the world mm. it's maybe emphasized the urgency mm. of these things that I'm trying to address and communicating that with a bigger uh, audience. Mm -mm -mm. Which is your biggest dream in the future? <sighs> my biggest dream to in save the, the future. World. My dream for my artwork or for how I want to live my life? You, yeah. Yeah, which is the same actually. I mean, I'm in, I'm talking to a few friends who are starting a commune. Ah, nice. Or, I mean, a commune is quite a sh politically loaded word. Or They're starting a project in the countryside, which mm. is going to be self-sustaining, growing your own vegetables, solar panels, all these right. kind of things. And they've bought a bit of land, uh, an old radio tower, beautiful mm. architecture, and they're trying to build a community there. And... I'm just in the process of considering whether I'm going to try and join this, not to live there full time, but just to move my studio there and nice. uh, half of the week spend it more in nature. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'm not completely shut off from 
the developing world, mm -hmm. uh, live half the week in the city. But I need mm -hmm. to work out whether it's yeah. whether I'm ready for that. But it feels like the kind of time to make big choices and, like I was saying, live your values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let your values reflect in mm -hmm. how you live your life. The, the previous episode was about community, uh, living in community, yeah. uh, alternative ways to live in harmony with, uh, with the world. One of this was uh, living in community, where community means uh, sharing our product, sharing, uh, sharing our skill, um, you know, stay together. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we need this. <laughs> we need this, exactly. But how this how realistic time. is it for an ever-growing population? Uh, I think there's always going to be small groups of people who do that in a very beautiful, harmonious way. Mm -hmm. But for the general public, I don't think mm -hmm. that's an option to go back into like tribal, small group dynamics. You know, we're in mm -hmm. a globalized world where that's sadly not that possible anymore. Exactly. Or it is, but a lot of people would see it as going backwards. It's not progress. How do people can find your work? Do you have a website, social network? Um... Uh, I've got an Instagram. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm in the process of um, yeah, redoing my website and stuff. So you've caught me at a bit of a bad time. I can't. It's but fine. At some point, when the website's up and running, we can. I will post it. We can post it website. in the comments on the podcast. <laughs> Sounds good. But my Instagram, yeah. Instagram is you Richard can... Green Studio. Richard Green Studio. Okay. At Instant No, but not at Instagram, but we'll pop it in the comments yeah, yeah. and people will find you anyway. I hope so. After after the, the big sculpture <laughs> in the, the forest, the people will ask, who did this? Follow the sugar trail of ants. Yeah. <laughs> He's the one. He's the one. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to go into hiding. Okay, thank you for coming, uh, Richard. No it was a pleasure to speak with you to yeah. unravel the mystery about uh, the yeah. human relation with nature. Cut.